To keep the peace, to pioneer the future, the new mission of your AAF. cooperation with the American Broadcasting Company, the Army Air Forces presents Your AAF, a report to the American people on its continuing operations today throughout the world and their adventures in research, which are pioneering for your better world tomorrow. Tonight you will hear from Wright Field, the AAF's vast research laboratory, an actual blind landing made by a pilot who never touched the controls. From Washington, Lieutenant Colonel Lewis C. Grayson, answering directly a mother's questions about her soldier son. From Japan, an interview with Generals Giles, Linnae, and O'Donnell before the first non-stop flight from Japan to the United States, and from Washington, the first radio pickup of their arrival. And as always, the singing voices in the orchestra of the AAF, bringing you the best of the top music of the day. And from the All Soldier Orchestra, it's a tune in the tempo of the time. Get happy. Dayton, Ohio, the vast research laboratories of the AAF, backbone of American air might. Notable among Wright Field's achievements are the many safety devices developed during war to protect our airmen, all of which now become part of our daily lives. One of the most exciting of these is a device to land planes under any weather conditions entirely by radio control and without any assistance from the pilot. Your AAF takes you now by Army wire recorder to the completely hooded pilot's compartment of an Army plane now approaching Wright Field. To describe this landing, your AAF radio correspondent, Captain Bob Van Camp. Go ahead, Captain. This is your AAF reporter, Captain Bob Van Camp, speaking from the pilot's compartment of the Blind Bat, a C-47 airplane flying at 2,000 feet, somewhere about seven miles from right field. In just a moment, we're going to attempt one of the most unusual broadcasts ever made. We're going to tell you just what happens as this great transport plane comes in for a completely automatic landing without human hands touching the controls. The windshield of our blind bat is hooded by a black cloth. It's impossible to see outside. Our pilot, Captain Dick Orchard of Lakewood, Ohio, is going to use an automatic pilot, which has been coordinated with the standard instrument approach system of the AAF. The system was developed by the Air Technical Service Command to make airplane landings simpler and safer, regardless of weather conditions. At this moment, two different radio beams are being sent out from the runway area at right field. One marks the center of the runway, and the other indicates the descending path that our plane should take for its landing. All Captain Orchard needs to do is get on these two beams and then put his plane on automatic pilot. Mechanical brains will do the rest. Let's listen now to the landing preparations underway. All right, tower, right tower. This is Blind Bat, over. Blind Bat, this is right tower, over. Uh, right tower, this is Blind Bat, seven miles west at 2,000. Request clearance for automatic approach and landing. Over. 
Brian Bass, this is Wright Tower. Brian Bass, this is Wright Tower. You are cleared for approach and landing. Over. Uh, Wright Tower, this is Brian Bass. Roger, out. Captain, what happens now that you're cleared by Wright Field for this automatic landing? I'll turn on the automatic approach. And from now on, we will, until we land, the blind bat will fly itself. Say, I can feel this airplane banking and turning as it gets set. That means the automatic pilot has taken hold, huh? What do you do now, Captain Orchard? All we have to do now is sit tight and watch the instrument panel and get ready for the final landing. Let's make our landing check now, Max. Okay. Gear down and lock. High RPM, 20 degrees of flat. Booster pumps are on. Hydraulic pressure's up. Set. On the instrument panel, a little vertical needle can be seen exactly centered on the indicator dial. That shows that we're right in line with the runway at right field. Another horizontal needle tells us that we're descending at just the right angle. That's where this automatic pilot has it all over manual landing. You know you're coming in just right. All right, tower, right tower. This is my bat on final board. Uh, Brian Bat, this is right tower. You're clear to land. Over. All right, tower. This is blind bat. Roger, out. How close are we now, Captain Orchard? Uh, less than four miles now, maybe three. How can you tell? See this light just above the indicator? Uh-huh. It flashed two times a second just before I called the tower. When we get one mile out, it will start flashing six times a second. When we're down to 50 feet over the end of the runway, it will burn continuously. Our blacked-out C-47 is going down at approximately 400 feet a minute, and believe me, that's fast when you're under a hood. In case you're interested in the brains behind this new development, credit for combining these two great safety features goes to Lieutenant Colonel F.L. Mosley, Chief of the Communications and Navigation Laboratory at Wright Field. Thanks to him and the engineers under his direction in the radio and radar subdivision, this new system for easy, safe, blind landings should soon prove a boon to civilian pilots, and in fact to every person who flies in the air age of tomorrow. This is really an eerie feeling, knowing that the Earth is coming up at you and not being able to see it. There goes that light. It's flashing faster now. We've one mile to go, and the ground is just 200 feet below. Both pilots are watching their instruments intently. Rough, sir, that ground is getting close. It won't be long now. If everything goes okay, we'll be hitting the runway soon. The light's steady now. The altimeter shows 50 feet. Falling fast. 25 feet now. Get set. Here we go, down to the runway. There we are. We made it. We're rolling on the runway. It was a perfect landing. Now let's tear off the hood and look out. Yes, sir, we're lined up perfectly on the runway. And that's how the automatic pilot ties in with the AAF instrument approach system. From Wright Field, we return you now to your AAF in New York. Thank you, Wright Field, for another notable contribution called the safety of the future. <laughs> Just ten years ago, Wright Field was already peering into the future, and the first automatic pilots were being tested. Ten years ago, in 1935, when the only piloting most of us were doing was the girlfriend around the dance floor, or staring her outside to look at such natural phenomena as Sergeant Bob Carroll and the singing voices of the AAF described for you. Blue Moon. Blue Moon. saw me standing alone without a dream in my heart without a love of my own Blue moon, you knew just what I was there for
Regular center number 49. She's the only one that we know my way. On the edge of Santa Pica, Santa Fe. She's the old folk riding round the bend. I reckon that she knows she's going to meet a friend. Folks around me, I'm getting the time of day. From the edge of Santa Pica, the Santa Fe. Here she comes. Jen, you better get the rest. Ooh, 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 ooh. She's got a list of passengers that's pretty big, and they'll all want to live in the Brown Hotel. Cause lots of them been traveling for quite a spell, all the way from Philadelphia. On the Atta Santa Pica and the Santa Fe. The Atta Santa Pica and the Santa Fe. Do you hear that whistle down the line? Never been bombed, uh, so the runway is in fairly good condition. 
General O'Donnell, why was this airfield picked for the start of the flight? It was selected because it's the only aerodrome in Japan which is adequate for uh, fully loaded B-29 takeoffs. Did the Japanese use this field for long-range air operations? Uh, not to our knowledge, but we understand that the Japanese had a project for launching uh, one-way four-engine bomber kamikaze attacks from this field against our aircraft industry on the west coast. Uh, sir, what proportion of the flight will be over water? Approximately one-third of it. General May, do you anticipate good weather all the way? In making a flight of this distance, it's impossible to find atmospheric conditions that will give you good weather throughout the entire route. We expect to have bad weather over a portion of the route. How were your crews picked for this flight, General Giles? All of these crews completed 35 missions or more against the enemy. And they were scheduled to go back to the States on normal rotation. And one more question, sir. Will you carry our wire recording to Washington in your B-29? Yes, Major West. We will be very glad to accommodate you. Thank you, Lieutenant General Barney M. Giles, Major General Curtis E. LeMay, and Brigadier General Emmett O'Donnell for giving us information on your history-making flight. May we wish you good luck and Godspeed. This is your AAF reporter returning you to the United States. In the lead plane of this flight, carried from Japan to Washington in a matter of some 28 hours, was the wire recording you have just heard. In Washington, to pick it up and to cover the landing was our AAF reporter, Captain Howard Finch. For his eyewitness report of the landing, we take you now by Army wire recorder to Washington and Captain Howard Finch. This is your AAF reporter, Captain Howard Finch, speaking from the Bradley Point Airport of the ATC in Washington, D.C. Yesterday at 4.01 p.m. Eastern Wartime, three silver battle-tested B-29s roared off the runways of Mr. Tommy Field and the Japanese home islands of Hokkaido and headed toward the United States in a great circle route that was destined to carry them over one quarter of the distance around the Earth's surface. Fierce headwinds were encountered over northern Canada today, which necessitated the use of more fuel and anticipated with the result that the Superfort landed at Chicago, refueled, and just a few moments ago, landed in Washington, and are now taxing to the apron here in front of the ATC terminal. And the crowd is milling around. The first man out of the B-29, Lieutenant General Barney Giles. He looks a little tired, but he's smiling. Smiling and seems very happy. And we're going to try and get our microphones up here where we can pick up some of the official greetings. The crew of the first B-29M are now beginning to file out of the airplane. There is a terrific crowd milling around the plane now of congratulations being roared out. Bands are playing in the background. The individual members of the crew are being congratulated. General Arnold is talking to General Giles. And now one of the crew members of the B-29s that have just landed. What is your name? Leo Miller, sir. And what's your rank, Leo? Staff Sergeant. And what was your job on the B-29? I was uh, one of the two radio operators that came along to uh, carry on communications between air-to-air -air and air-to-ground. And which ship, Sergeant? On uh, number three, sir. Where's your hometown? Brooklyn, New York. And how does it feel to be back now? It feels great to be back in civilization again, for one thing. Where, where were you stationed, Sergeant? Saipan in the Marianas, 73rd Wing. And what are your plans for the future? Well, I intend to go to college, University of Minnesota, to be exact. I'm the flight sergeant. What, what was the one thing that thrilled you perhaps the most? Well, we saw three Russian fighter planes up by Siberia that uh, recognized us and rattled their wings and then took off. And uh, it was great to look down on those American cities again, Chicago and Washington at night. Good. Thank you very much, Sergeant. And now, ladies and gentlemen, General of the Army, H. H. Arnold. I want to tell you, Barney and Rosie and Kurt, that I'm very proud of the flight that you made. The crews and the planes and the leaders all lived up to our expectations. We knew that the B-29 was good because we saw what happened in Japan. But we didn't know whether or not it could make this long flight back to the United States. And in spite of the headwinds, you made a wonderful flight. And I want to congratulate all of you. Bill Arnold, 
Colonel. Thanks very much for your congratulations. Uh, you not only think the airplane is all right. I talked to a number of Jap pilots and the head of the Japanese Air Force. He said the B-29 is the best bomber in the world. <laughs> General Allen, what do you want to know? General Allen, what is the true significance of this flight from Japan to the United States? The true significance of the flight was to give a real workout to the B-29 to see what it could do in the way of traveling long distances until we could get some idea of the distance to be covered and the time it would require to cover the distances. We need that information for the future to, to figure out just what we can expect of airplanes of this type. Thank you, sir. General LeMay, anything of an unusual nature happen on the flight? No, everything functioned perfectly. If it hadn't been for the headwind, we'd been here. Uh, actually, we flew more air miles than was necessary to make the trip. Where did you first hit the headwind? We hit them all the way. I was 20 miles all the way yeah. across. Thank you, sir. General O'Donnell, at what height did you fly coming across in the main? Uh, we started out rather low and worked up to uh, 25,000 feet, which is the highest we attained. And, at, and uh, landing in Chicago and coming into Washington, what height did you fly in from there? Uh, we flew in formation 9,000 feet. Anything of an unusual nature? No, nothing at all. all. Nothing at all, except that we were uh, intercepted by two Russian uh, fighter pilots in P-63s off Kamchatka, who uh, gave us a big high ball and waved their wings at us and sent us in our way. And the United States looked mighty, mighty good. It surely does. Thank you, sir. And that about concludes the ceremonies of welcoming these three heroic crews who have landed here at Gravelly Airport of the ATC in the nation's capital at Washington, D.C. We return you now to your AAF in New York. <laughs> To keep the peace, to pioneer the future. This is your AAF. During the last half hour, you've been listening to the official program of the Army Air Forces, your AAF, which came to you from New York City. This is the American Broadcasting Company. Which came to you from New York City. This is the American Broadcasting Company.